This is CBC Public Broadcasting. Monday on the 5.30, fashion on a skateboard. Big, baggy, and cool. Confrontation. Nova Scotia fishermen blockade a Russian trawler. Middies clash. Airstrikes in Lebanon. Rocket attacks in Israel. Sunday Report with Wendy Mesley. Good evening. Month after month of bitter frustration in Canada's East Coast fishery has come to a head tonight in Shelburne, Nova Scotia. Hundreds of local fishermen have surrounded a Russian trawler, which they say is guilty of overfishing. The trawler is filled with cod, a fish that is strictly off limits to Canadian vessels. The Russian crew claims the catch didn't come from Canadian waters, but in Shelburne, very few people, if any, believe that. The CBC's Leslie McKinnon has the latest tonight on the Shelburne Showdown. Fishermen filled Shelburne Harbor with their boats and a message. They just aren't going to take it anymore. I can stay tied here forever. I might as well tell you, till they take everything. When they take the boat, I'll be out of here. These fishermen think that foreign fishing boats are cheating. They're legally allowed to catch underutilized species such as silver hake, but also allowed to keep any bycatch of other fish. This often means foreign boats keep more fish than many local fishermen can catch under their drastically reduced quotas. So local fishermen want the government to kick all foreign fleets out of Canadian waters. And they don't act right now. Is going, the way I hear the talk around the wharf, there's, someone's going to get hurt. This Russian cargo ship is supposed to be carrying 1,300 tons of frozen fish which crew members claim came from the Barents Sea, far away from Canada. Local fishermen don't believe it. There is Russian vessels over here fishing our water right now. So, I mean, uh, which makes us very uh, skeptical whether all these fish did come from the Bering Sea. I mean, how would you ever know? I mean, you know. Most people in Shelburne support the fishermen's blockade. Some businesses tomorrow will close in protest. Even though the thought of illegal action makes the president of the Chamber of Commerce uneasy. That is a dilemma. Uh, and, and, and I'll agree with that. And, and I think we all have some degree of sympathy for the people on this boat. Um, but then again, you employ whatever methods you can to make yourself heard. Today, the Premier met okay. with fishermen and promised to talk to the Prime Minister. But even he admitted he couldn't be sure that the Russian vessel is carrying Canadian fish. To the very upset, frustrated, and uh, very frightened and worried people in the fishing industry, that boat's a symbol. Tomorrow morning, when a local stevedoring company tries to unload the Russian vessel, the fishermen here say they will block the way. In a letter to the Minister of Fisheries, they say this isn't a protest, this is war. And one Russian freighter has become a hostage. Leslie McKinnon, CBC News, Shelburne. There was a bloody attack this evening in South Africa. Evil, in the words of the country's president. Gunmen attacked a church congregation. They burst in with automatic assault rifles and hand grenades. Police say at least 10 people were killed and more than 50 others wounded. The attack happened in a predominantly white suburb in Cape Town. Police say the gunmen were black. It is the deadliest attack against a white target in South Africa this year. Martin C. Mungal is the CBC's correspondent in South Africa, and he joins us now on the phone from Johannesburg. Martin, tomorrow uh, was to be a very big day in the constitutional talks, black and white leaders to unveil a new draft plan of the Constitution. Do you think that this, the timing of this attack has, uh, has been coincidental or not? Well, Wendy, it, it certainly every time there's a, a major political development in South Africa, the whole country braces itself and takes a breath because uh, it's usually accompanied by some kind of uh, outbreak of violence. Now, they've seen nothing like this, but uh, say, having said that, it, it's also important to say that, uh, that one of the organizations at the table, the uh, Pan-Africanist Congress, its armed wing, uh, has uh, has said that it will continue with the armed struggle, and it has said that it will continue to target whites. Well, of course, we don't know yet who is responsible for this attack, but I, what kind of, of impact do you think it will have on the talks? Could this attack on whites this time uh, sabotage the talks? 
Well, most of the politicians uh, sitting around the table will uh, will certainly uh, condemn this from from every corner of the table. But thousands of blacks have been killed, uh, you know, in, as as this whole process has moved forward, and and uh, it's failed to to finally derail the talks. Uh, most of the politicians believe that uh, that the only way to uh, to end this violence once and for all is to get a political settlement. That is to forge a non-racial South Africa with a new constitution and a new form of government. They believe that the, that that will be the only thing that will end the violence. All right, Martin C. Muggle, thank you very much. Thank you, Wendy. Tensions are running high in the Middle East tonight after the heaviest Israeli attack on Lebanon in 10 years. Israeli warplanes and helicopter gunships staged six separate attacks. They struck four times at targets belonging to the pro-Iranian Hezbollah in southern Lebanon and twice at bases of the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, just south of Beirut. Later, Lebanese guerrillas hit back, firing Soviet-made rockets into northern Israel as well as Israel's self-declared security zone in southern Lebanon. Tonight, at least 18 people on both sides of the border are dead, including as many as six Syrian soldiers. And the Middle East peace process is seriously strained. We have a report now from Michael McMillan of the BBC. The northern Israeli town of Kiryat Shemona tonight and fires follow rocket attacks by pro-Iranian Hezbollah groups in the Lebanon. There was panic in the streets. Residents had been instructed to stay in bomb shelters all day, but it seems some ignored the direction. Two people were killed and eight people were injured. A short time ago, Israel's prime minister gave this reaction. If there will be no tranquility here, there will be no tranquility to all the Lebanese in southern Lebanon, north of the security zone. North of Israel's self-declared security zone, its artillery was firing at Hezbollah positions in southern Lebanon. Apache attack helicopters were in the air for this biggest Israeli raid upon targets there for more than 10 years. At Name, nine miles from Beirut, Plumes of smoke rose above the Palestinian positions, which the Israelis had aimed for. At Baalbek, a center of support for the pro-Iranian Hezbollah, there were more explosions as Israeli planes fired rockets at their targets. And at Mashgara, Israeli helicopters hit a Syrian military post, killing Syrian soldiers. Later, the Israelis were anxious to emphasize that that was an accident and that the Syrians were not their intended targets. This evening, the Israeli Air Force released these pictures of today's attacks taken by cameras fixed to their planes. Today's Israeli offensive indicates just how far off any question of a Middle East peace settlement really is. The involvement of the Syrian military today with a number of their soldiers killed is a dangerous development. The last thing the Israelis need is an open confrontation with the Syrians, who they still perceive to be their most powerful enemy. Michael McMillan, BBC News, in Jerusalem. It's early Monday morning in the Mideast, and the clashes are continuing. Helicopter gunships are hitting targets in southern Lebanon, and all this fighting follows a number of warnings from Israel. Several of its soldiers have been attacked in the past month, and it said it would strike back. The latest UN-brokered ceasefire in Bosnia collapsed within hours of coming into effect. And the UN itself was one of the main targets in Sarajevo today. About 70 tank and mortar rounds hit UN vehicles near the center of the Bosnian capital. French peacekeepers scrambled out of their vehicles and escaped to safety when the attack began. Three vehicles were damaged, but there were no injuries. UN officials say they believe the Serbs attacked the base. We believe in the area uh, from Serb controlled positions. However, uh, we cannot say with full certainty right now. We have called in an engineering team to uh, do some crater analysis and study of the uh, trajectory of the shells that had come in to try to determine uh, with some confirmation exactly where that came in. The three warring factions have accused each other of breaking the ceasefire. In the American Midwest, people spent the weekend trying to contain the raging Mississippi. 
and the river is still winning most of the battles. Today, the U.S. Agriculture Secretary called the situation worse than a disaster. He says it's a calamity. A levee breaks near Quincy, Illinois, sending water over thousands more acres of farmland. In Parkville, Missouri, volunteers help with sandbagging, trying to defend the water plant. So conserve their water, use it for drinking purposes only. Do not take showers, do not take baths. Uh, there is water, but it's a limited supply. It's what's in the uh, tower. But in St. Joseph, Missouri, it was too late. Water is trucked in for 75,000 people after floods shut down the pumping station. On the other side of the world, another flood and more people fighting back. India is one of the countries affected by five weeks of monsoon rain. Food and medicine are being handed out to millions who have lost their homes. All told, more than 2,000 people have died in India, Nepal, and Bangladesh. In Sri Lanka, Tamil guerrillas overran a major army garrison today. 16 civilians were killed and 26 soldiers injured in the attack on the camp and a nearby civilian settlement. An army spokesman said about 200 Liberation Tigers attacked the base in the country's northeast. Germany has sent troops abroad for the first time since the Second World War. Its soldiers joined UN peacekeepers in Somalia this week, but the deployment is controversial at home. There have been demonstrations with some of the loudest protests coming from men fighting Germany's system of mandatory military service. The CBC's Berlin correspondent, Anna Maria Tremonti, has that story. At 31, graphic artist Andreas Hutner is one of the oldest men in Germany still trying to dodge the draft. He thought he'd outmaneuvered the recruiters when he moved to West Berlin in the mid-80s. The city was under Allied control during the Cold War, and its residents were exempt from Germany's mandatory military service. But when the wall came down, the army went looking for men like Hutner. Up to the 6th of October, when I'm uh, 32, up to this time, they can draft me. Thousands of men in Berlin who thought they had escaped the draft are now being told to show up for military service. Instead, they show up at meetings like this one, where activists teach them how to tie up the bureaucracy and avoid the law. Martin Charnka resisted the draft as a citizen of East Germany, only to be drafted again by a unified Germany. Just before the fall of communism, I saw soldiers used against their own people, he says. That was the point where I said never. Those who are drafted have a choice. 12 months in combat training or 15 months doing civilian work in hospitals and social services. German men have always been able to substitute their stint in the military with civilian service. What's different now is that a growing number of them are choosing not to be soldiers. Close to half of potential recruits say they want civilian work, almost double the number who made that request during the Cold War. It will be a concern for the German army if this uh, trend continues, and uh, therefore I think uh, the politicians think about uh, uh, criteria to make it easier to decide uh, joining the army. But to be a soldier in Germany today is to be part of a heated political debate. German peacekeepers in Somalia are the first troops to be assigned outside the country since World War II. That has raised a storm of protest, including incidents like this one, where demonstrators stripped to draw attention to their arguments. Instead, they drew the attention of the police. They fear even those doing civilian service may be forced into war zones. Activists like Christian Herz are convinced Germany has ambitions that go beyond peacekeeping. We think uh, it's a junior partner of the USA in the world, and this means that they try to, um, um, to create a new kind of order in the world. A vocal number of Germans are pushing for a full-time volunteer army. But defense officials insist conscription will continue 
and will be enforced. Anna Maria Tremonti, CBC News, Berlin.